Welcome back to BT, an absolute honor to have one of the most celebrated writers of our time here on the BT Couch, Salman Rushdie. Welcome. Hello. Uh, holding the new book right here, The Golden House, add this to your collection, and uh, this, a terrific piece that conquers a great deal of content. Uh, the chaos of modern politics, transgender issues, autism, nationalism. Uh, what was the big idea you wanted to share with your latest piece? You know, it was really two things coming together. One was I wanted to tell the story of this strange, shady family from India, a uh, wealthy family with skeletons in the closet that, that changes everything and changes their names, conceals their past, relocates to New York, and tries to get away from the past, but of course it comes after them. So that was the story I began with. But then I also had this idea of wanting to write a book right up against the present moment, you know, to do, do something which in a way you're not supposed to do, which is to write a book about the exact moment that the book's being written in, you know, and try and capture the flavor of that time and what people are thinking about. So like some of those issues you mentioned, you know, autism, Occupy Wall Street, trans HG, LGBT issues, you know, all of that, try and somehow have that in the book as well as just the straightforward narrative. Well, as you captured the present moment, I think of the one thing that stands out for me is the museum of identity, and identity is yeah. such a powerful conversation yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, you've lived across the world. In terms of human nature, yeah. identity, how are, we, how are we the same? How are we different from country to country? Well, you know, the thing is, and I think it's one of the reasons for reading novels, you know, is that the thing that never changes is human nature. You know, we are, we are all the same thing wherever in the world we live and at whatever time. And that's one reason why, you know, you could pick up a book written 300 years ago and still relate to it because the thing that doesn't change is human nature. But, you know, we do live in a very turbulent time and this identity issue of course this is a family trying to change its identity so right there it's at the center of the book but one of the things that interested me is that in different parts of the world it means different things you know so like in India when people talk about identity they mostly are talking about religious identity you know they're talking about Hindu Muslim issues you know um, in America right now in the United States when people talk about identity it's usually either race or gender you know that those are the sort of hot button topics. In England, as the whole Brexit thing showed, it was identity became some kind of nostalgia for a gold, it's sort of imaginary golden age of England, you know, when there weren't any foreigners around. And, um, uh, and so I thought, here's a strange thing that the subject of identity is so big that it becomes different things in different places. So I made up this museum. And I had, actually, I had to check, I had to check in the, uh, by, on Google to make sure there actually wasn't one, because I thought it's the sort of thing there should be. Well, Salman Rushdie's uh, Museum of Identity coming yeah. soon because it, it's an idea where you present it and you think, how do we not have this exactly. already? I feel that it will be there in, in like six minutes' time. You're ahead <laughs> of your time, as always with the literature. Right. But one of the interesting uh, themes that's presented is the idea of displacement. I mean, mm. my folks came from East Africa. Yeah. I relate to this idea. But for you, you, you've doubled down with displacement in your life going from India to the UK, now almost 20 years living in, in the States in yeah. New York City. Yeah. Uh, what is the true benefit of being connected to three different places in your life? Well, I mean, you know, there's clearly I mean, the big benefit, in, particularly in a, in a time like this when the world is so small, you know, is to get a bit of a sense of how things join up, you know, about, about how this place connects to that place and to the other place. You know, and, and I think increasingly I felt that's a big subject for, for my literature, certainly, is that trying to make those connections to say this is, this is happening over here, but it's related to this happening over there, like we were just saying about identity, you know. So, um, that's the advantage. The disadvantage, I think, is sometimes I envy writers who've lived their entire life in like one small town, you know, and have been able to make a whole career out of, a whole body of work out of their depth of knowledge of that place. The kind of William Faulkner writer, you know, living in one tiny patch of the world and being, knowing it so deeply that they can mine it forever. So that, that's not what I could do, but I could do this other thing. Well, you introduce ideas, some controversial over the years, but there's always that element of critical thinking. And one of the uh, ideas you recently presented that really resonated with me was uh, just thought, and that college should be a safe space of thought, not a safe space from thought. Yeah, absolutely. And when we look at politics today and we see a polarizing effect, one, we deal with political correctness, two, mm. we deal with dangerously polarizing politics, mm. how do you think we get people to productively disagree now? Well, you know, we used to be able to do it. 
You know, I mean, it's not so long ago that people could actually have quite strong political disagreements without getting into fistfights. You know, um, and and I think we just got to rediscover it. I think I think uh, there's there's a thing that happens now where the moment anybody says like one word that somebody disapproves of. Firestorm. You, yeah, yeah, firestorm. Got to, they've got to lose their job, they've got to be sort of publicly shamed, and et cetera. And, and this kind of mob rule, um, which social media makes possible, I think is very, very worrying. And that's, and that's mainly coming from the left, you know. It's coming from the progressive end of the spectrum, and that's worrying. I don't like it. I mean, I expect the conservative or extreme conservative forces to be bullying. I don't, I don't expect progressive forces to be, you know. So I think we've all got to grow up a little bit. Well, the expression and how we're expressing our own beliefs has definitely changed. And for you as an artist with the ideas you present in this book, how do you express yourself differently through pen to paper versus what you would do through a basic conversation? Well, you know, a book is, isn't a good a novel. First of all, it takes, too long, it takes a long time to write. So it isn't a good way of talking about immediate things. You know, because we also live in, in a world in which the subject changes very fast. You know, and if it takes you two years to write a book, you're sort of 30 subjects later. You know what I mean? So, so if I'm going to talk about sort of like what's in the news today, then I think it's it's better to do it like this, or by or by writing an op-ed or something. You know, um, a novel you write to last. And, and, and so, I mean, I would like, I like it that some of my earlier books, you know, like Midnight Children and so on, like 36, 37 years later, that people still find them relevant, you know, that I'm proud of. And I think that's why you do it. You do it for the books to outlast you. And, and that means, even if you're dealing with very contemporary matters, you have to remember that you're really telling the stories of human beings and, and you're trying to do it in a way that will endure. In this book, you open up with the inauguration of Obama and then end seeing a new presidency mm. with a character known as the Joker. Mm. Everyone that's read it is making comparisons to U.S. President Donald Trump. And over this uh, eight-year span that's outlined in the book, mm. what do you think will be the lasting sentiment of this particular era years down the line? Well, you know, what I, the reason the book brackets its story with those two moments is to say that, you know, I remember in 2008 the election of Obama. I was in New York and I spent a lot of that night going around the city streets to, to see where people were gathering, you know, and, and like Rockefeller Center, Union Square, places like that. And, and the kind of joy in people's faces uh, was quite extraordinary to, uh, to witness, you know. And, and I thought to go from that moment of extreme optimism you know, to almost its antithesis eight years later. Um, is a tragic arc, but it's an interesting arc, you know, and, and, and that journey, that journey from great hope to, to something very dark, you know, is, is that's, that's the story of the, that's the context of the story, you know, that's what's happening behind the lives of the characters. And so, yeah, of course, when, when Trump began to run for president, I thought, and, and began to talk, take up all available airspace, you know. <laughs> I thought it would be silly not to mention this. It would be very foolish to just not have that in the book. So then I thought, you know, that in a deck of cards, the two most unusual playing cards are the Trump and the Joker. So, so if I don't want the Trump in it, I'll have the Joker instead. And 95% of this was what, written even before the before. results of the election yeah, last the, year? My book guessed right. You know, what is so strange <laughs> is that I guessed wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, right up to election day, I was thinking and hoping that the other thing would happen, you know, um, and my book understood something that I didn't. The logic of the book all the way was that this this had to happen, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, I knew that if, if the election had gone the other way, I would have to do some rewriting, but it wouldn't really have affected the storyline, because the storyline's not about that, you know, um, but it would have affected the context, you know, and I would have had to do, do so. I mean, I did do some reshaping anyway, but but most of it, like 90%, 95% of it was written before Election Day. Fascinating. Well, you've created an interesting conversation piece with this book. I guess final question for all of the aspiring writers out there today. Yeah. You've mentioned social media. We're overwhelmed with information, uh, the pace at which information moves. But for the true, true storyteller, what do you find is still the key today to not only capture attention, but keep the attention of your audience? Oh, you know, interesting human beings. You, know, you, have, you have to, uh, it doesn't matter how good you are at 
at social context. You know, I mean, that's a very important part of, of writing. You know, but I, what I think of is, that if you think about Charles Dickens, his, the backgrounds of his novels were always intensely realistic. I mean, really obsessively realistic. But against those backgrounds, he would project these, these larger-than-life characters, you know, who people came to love. And the reason we bought the characters is because they were so deeply rooted in reality, you know. But the reason we read the books is because of the larger-than-life characters, you know. So, so in the end, it's, it's find interesting people to write about. Well, Nero Golden and his family brings that and then some. The Golden House is the name of the book. Uh, Salman Rushdie, an absolute pleasure to have you here. You. Thank you. All right, we'll take a break. More to come here on Breakfast Television. Stay tuned. Add this one to All the right, collection. Thank you. Well, yeah. I'm glad you liked it.